This is an introduction to Kodak XX5222, but it's an in-depth one. Okay, um, where are we starting? Way up here. Why I made the video. So this is one of my favorite films. Uh, I hope it never goes away. If I could only shoot one film for the rest of my life, this is probably it. Uh, if you go on the internet, I mean, I've done this, right? And you read everything there is um, about double X. And you watch all the YouTube videos. You're going to find a lot of conflicting claims. You'll be pretty confused. And there's a lot of things that are just not sensical or true so I hope to add a lot of clarity to what the truth is uh, I know more about this film than probably all but 10 or at most 100 photographers in the world um, and after you watch this video you'll probably know more than all but maybe a thousand um, and the number might actually be smaller than that Okay, a little history. In the 1950s, and not just the 1950s, but especially the 1950s, Kodak was like the NASA of film. And they developed some amazing films. And Double X came around, I think maybe 1959. Uh, the f and it's, it's a cinema film. Right, and so I think, I think Psycho was 1960, maybe. I think the release date, and it was shot on Double X. And so often, if you look up like Double X online, you'll find a list of movies shot on Double X, and it's an impressive list, right? Schindler's List, Psycho, Oppenheimer, Memento, and recently, two of my favorites, uh, The Lighthouse and the Forty Year Old Version, not Virgin, Version. Um, yeah, so if you're just sort of looking for, for movies, um, and right, the story is that it's basically an unchanged film in the last 60 years, basically since like the late fifties, uh, that Kodak hasn't really tinkered with it. Now, every manufacturer of film is going to make small changes to a product, for whatever reason, maybe to improve it, or maybe just kind of to roll with the changes and what's available. Um, but there's, I think it's safe to say there's been no major changes, right, in the last 60 years, which is pretty cool because the rest of Kodak's black and white offerings, right, including Tri-X, right, have gone through um, evolutions and some radical changes, right, from, for example, when Tri-X became 400TX, um, so, yeah, I, th I have a lot of topics, <laughs> so we're going to, we're going to move pretty fast here. Um, and sorry, the, the order of these is not great. It's a little bit of just kind of how it came to me. So, but we're going to get through it all. Reciprocity, uh, right. There's definitely a lot of fear that this film has poor reciprocity characteristics, Right. If if you're going to shoot something where you need to use maybe a four second shutter. Right. Oh, no, this is a cinema film. It's not going to work. Because it's made for cinema and cinema doesn't use two second exposures. OK. Not true. This film is has just as good reciprocity characteristics as uh, Tri-X. Right. Um, and really anything except for maybe uh, Fuji across. It's, um, right, if you look at their actual literature, it's like they say that you don't need to apply any reciprocity, each, um, you know, factor for one ten thousandth all the way up to a second. Um, now, I haven't done a lot of long exposures, but I've read articles by people who have, and their recommendation is, 
if you're going to shoot one to 10 seconds, add another stop. And then if you're going to go beyond 10 seconds, add two stops. And if and there's really nothing to worry about on the fast end, right? One ten thousand that can handle, and I don't know any um, mechanical cameras going faster than that. And then it, you know, is there a sweet spot for sort of the shutter speeds that movie cameras use? I mean, sure, but not really, right? It's you, um, you can shoot it just like any other film. Sharpness. Okay, so you, you'll you'll hear you'll hear people say that this is not a sharp film. Okay, I'm telling you, it's insanely sharp. Kodak, if you look at their marketing materials, right? Sentence one is going to talk about the sharpness of this film. Um, but it's a little bit where you have to kind of understand that sharpness is not a super easy simple concept right so this is like verichrome pan another previous kodak film where it is very sharp at lower frequencies so think of like the 5 the 10 the 20 lines per uh, millimeter um, but then not so much beyond that so Right, so it's not the type of sharpness that we're used to now with like high megapixel cameras and super, you know, so-called sharp lenses. Right? That's not the type of sharpness. Right? It's not that super fine detail. It's more of contours and edges and sort of coarser sharpness. Um, and, and I relate it a little bit if you use Lightroom or if you use Capture One. Right, it's much more like using the the clarity slider or maybe the structure sliders right as opposed to sharpness settings um right which means that this pairs well with older lenses that are that really kind of are sharp at those um lower frequencies right and, and weren't that in you know trying to get to super 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 uh high frequency sharpness yet so I did want to show just real quickly the PDFs, right? So here, this is this is the text sheet for 5222, right? Look at, so here's the spatial frequency on the x-axis, right? Here at these, lar like, um, I call them larger, but really like these, like the, the larger, they're larger because there's less cycles per millimeter, right? But here we've got, we're over at 100% response, on the MTF curve, right? It's almost like up to the 150, right? And it stays super freaking sharp. But then notice that it dives off pretty fast. And, um, and you know, it hits kind of like 50% around 40 cycles per millimeter. And then if we flip over to something like Tri-X, um, right, it does not get that sharp anywhere to start, but it sort of hangs out longer. And then it dips a little later, right? So, and that's this Tri-X. There's, right, another 400 speed film. Um, okay. So it's, it sort of, it takes a, right, which I, I, I really like it for this because it's a different type of sharpness than sort of anything else, and especially digital cameras. Um, well, without, you know, you can, you can uh, digitally edit yourself, kind of a, a simulation of it. Okay, spectral sensitivity. So, uh, let's scroll over a little bit. It's panchromatic film, um, but I will show you. I'll show you the. Let's just look at the sheet, right? Um, okay. So they're telling you two things here. One is that you have slightly different response based on the amount of exposure and that's actually true for i think every film it's just that double x is right kodak is calling it out they also call this out for tri -X. and if other film manufacturers provided as good of a technical sheet as kodak does they would also be doing something like this um, but it's really nothing that you need to pay attention to it's like you can almost ignore it but notice how this high part is is in the, the uh, you know basically blue, 
right? The blue range, um, as opposed to the red. And we're not getting anything that's like near infrared, right? It's just a basic classic panchromatic film, but with a little more sensitivity in the blue range compared to like HP other films, right? Um, even compared to Triax. Okay. And you can almost ignore this, right? It's not, for most people, they don't really, it's like you just think of it as panchromatic. So I, I see I, I wrote a little less red sensitive than average, a little more blue sensitive than average. It's like Triax, but with just a little more blue sensitivity, right? And I really like it because um, for my family portraits, it just creates a little more separation of the face tones and the lip tones. So it makes the lips a little darker than something like a FOMA or even HP5. Um, you know, I said you know, it's not the best for shooting through haze. For the same reason, right, anytime you're, you're, shoot, you're relying more on blue light, right, you're just not getting as much penetration through, like, atmospheric haze or whatever. Uh, depends on the exposure, but yes, every film does. Um, and then a lot of 200 and 400 feet uh, speed films that are on the market, right, the reason they're able to say they're 200 or 400, and they are, is they're dumping in red-sensitive dyes that increase the speed um, but I don't like that look, right? I don't like the, the extra red, right? The skin tones get brighter, the, the lips wash out, and just you almost, I mean, I don't want to call it infrared, but you just start to get a little more, um, right, your reds get, get um, brighter, which is just not rarely the look I'm looking, what I'm wanting. So, right, I think that's a, a great thing that they didn't dump in a bunch of red sensitive dyes. Uh, <laughs> I've heard people say you can't shoot this film with filters. Total nonsense. You can absolutely use it with filters just like any other black and white film. Uh, you just have to keep into consideration the spectral sensitivity. The, the Lighthouse, the movie, they used a blue filter um, even though it's already a little more blue sensitive. Um, but that gave that movie like this feeling of almost being shot on a really old blue sensitive film. It kind of gives things like an old old era feeling. Um, yeah, if you can use red and orange filters, but you just got to keep in mind that if you're relying on red, and this is a little bit less sensitive to red, then you got it might have to give a little more compensation than an average film. Uh, which also relates to like we talk about the speed of the film, right? There's uh, Kodak is is says like if you're shooting in warm light, reddish light, give this another third to a half a stop, right? Okay, uh, availability. So right because this is a cinema film and it's right this is under the Kodak Eastman brand. It is not from Kodak Alaris, the photography side. So uh, you can't buy this from Kodak in standard cartridges. Um, but you can buy it in bulk, right, roll, cinema rolls. So um, I buy it by the 400 foot. You can buy it, I think, by the 1,000. There are companies that will divide it out, right? You can go, right, you can go online and find companies that will have made it a 100-foot roll. you got to pay a little more because they've done the work of breaking it down to a 100 foot roll. But there you know there's 100 foot bulk loaders are easy to find. There are also uh, an increasing number of 400 foot bulk loaders. Um, I have one. It's very nice. I think Midwest Film Company makes it. Um, so for people who bulk load like this is yay, right? You 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 love this. And then it's also, it's, there's so many companies that are going to bulk load it for you and sell it as a cartridge. So, right, Cinestill, Flick Film in Canada, Film Photography Project, Silbera, Midwest Film Company. And I could have made a long list here, right? It's, and this list is growing. And, and usually, you know, the key, I mean, a lot of times they want to tell you that this is double X. They're not trying to hide it, right? Everybody tries to hide that they're selling FOMA or generic Harman, right? hit me or whatever but this this is people want to tell you that you're shooting double x so it's usually like 52 xx or or um bwxx or you know some something in the name right and so 
you can find it. You might have to, you're definitely paying more, right, for companies that are marketing it and bulk loading it for you. Um, but it is available for sure. Uh, the price, the price has gone up because um, Kodak raised their prices like a, what, I don't know if it was a year or two ago. Um, so, I don't know, it jumped, I don't know, like 70 bucks for 400 feet or something. Um, but, you know, some nice little things here, right? They, Kodak does offer, if you're a student, they have a, a great student discount. I think they just have to see like a copy of your active student ID or something and you get a great student discount on it um, and then right, there's a lot of people who do buy this bulk and roll it so just find a friend and say hey I want to try it they'll be probably excited that you want to try it and uh, they'll just give you a roll for free okay we got a lot more to go through I hope you're hanging in there grain and graininess so this is a classic cubic grain film right we're not talking about tea grains, right? We're not talking about mixed grains, right? This is, um, right, again, this is a, a, a 50s technology. Uh, and it's also, a th it's the last Kodak film that relies entirely on 50s classic cubic grain technology, right? 400 TX, right? I'm not a total expert, but right? It, there, there's some amount of mixed grain tabular uh, grains in it at this point. I don't know if it's, you know, the percentage there, if it's 1% or 100%. <clears throat> um, and then how much grain? Well, if you don't want the grain, right, just shoot, just use um, a, a, a solvent developer like undiluted D76 or ID11 or Xtol, and the grain basically goes away. Um if you like the grain, right, I think it's a beautiful grain, and I like showing it off. I like it being part of my photographs. So I, I like more of a high-definition developer or diluting a solvent developer. Um, so I, I like it in that it sort of gives you a lot of control over how much grain you want. Um, you know, I think it's, it is, the graininess appears a little more, typically more grainy than, than, Triax does. Um, it's a little more like I mean, it's, it's a little more like HP five, although, and I don't want to go too far into this because I'm not that confident. But sort of like, kind of where the coarseness and the fineness of the grain, kind of how it relates to the amount of exposure, is a little different than HP five. Um, and I think I prefer it with Kodak, but still still figuring that one out. Uh, the quality control so. Kodak's quality control is very high. It's a very consistent product. And when I scan it, I very rarely have to do touch-up of little spots or imperfections in the emulsion. Um, freshness, right? Because the standard for freshness is so high in cinema industry, right? You Things are clearly dated, Um Right, Kodak will say, shoot this, they don't say mug, shoot this mug fresh. They should say, shoot it fresh. <clears throat> and they, you know, if you read the whole text sheet, right, it's a lot about keeping it fresh and, and developing it as soon as you shoot it. Um, but those are just really high quality control measures that are standard in the film industry. I have had zero issues with, I've had double X that's years, you know, three or four years old. I've had double X that I've uh, shot and waited months to develop and as far as I can tell right zero issues um, All right, this is actually a big one this next one the sprocket holes So this is the the perf the perfs are cinema style uh, They're not the typical photography perforations and the reason this can really matter is uh like I had a scanner that had an auto feed and it did not like double X. <clears throat> and I think there's sort of two factors here, but one is definitely these cinema style perfs. It didn't grab them. I mean, you, you, right. I think a lot of people can shoot double X and never notice this. They're, they're so similar that, and a lot of times it doesn't cause any problems and they just don't notice. Right. <clears throat> but I've also noticed with like certain reels, 
the kind kind of the plastic reels that you ratchet <clears throat> excuse me um sometimes those don't work that well with with double x and so right maybe be prepared for that i hate for somebody to buy 400 feet and then realize that they can't can't load it onto their reel um and then just kind of maybe be like okay well there are plenty of reels where it works just fine that for whatever tank system you have um, i use the the hughes metal reels and they're fantastic with double x um, and i've also used them with some plastic reels too but i think that's definitely a potential source of frustration of frustration if someone's not paying attention to it um i don't know if any cameras would have problems with with the cinema perforations i i don't think so but uh okay so right back to this is a cinema film so it is not on kodak's s-star polyester base this is a gray acetate base um right and and, and there are They've designed this to work in cinema cameras and to be st stored long term, possibly as a large reel. And so all that just means, right, it's like a low friction, it's low static, it's low dust, it's got, you, know, you don't feel lubricants, but there's basically things in there that are pro extra protection for the surface. And a lot of it that's just happening at a, you know, s subconscious level, but technically is, is sort of... Um, Right, it's in place for sort of like long-term storage running through a cinema camera and um, et cetera. It, it, uh, they advertise that it has high dimensional stability. Now, it's not like an S-Star and it's not, right, I wouldn't try to process, develop this at 130 degrees. <clears throat> but I've, I've developed this at 90 degrees a lot and had zero issues um the one time i i well i've done it more than once right i've developed it at 100 degrees fahrenheit and um, one time i got a little reticulation so i've just backed off down to like 85 90 um, when i want to go hotter and i've had zero problems so right the the expansion of the of the um, gelatin right right it needs to be needs to be able to expand as it fills with water and developer etc um, and then be able to right dry and come back you know what do you call it not de-expand right shrink and you want it to be able to do that in a way where it leaves basically no indication that it swelled um and and um a kodak kodak double x is excellent in this regard the base the base okay so it is not a, it is not perfectly flat right it's it has it's a little bit convex um, where if you were to put it on a table the only thing that's touching the table are the are the edges right it's got a little curve to it um, and i love this right so that means it's not touching the table it's easy to tell which side is the emulsion just by feel uh, for some reels, this is actually helps load faster, right? On my Hughes reels, it's always nice to kind of give it, give any film that sort of convex shape as you're loading. This has it naturally. Uh, it also makes the drying process easy to monitor. Uh, it does not have a rim jet layer, right? Some people think, oh, it's a cinema film. It's going to have a rim jet layer. It does not, right? It's just a basic gray acetate safety safety base scannability so right some people like a very th flat thin transparent negative for scanning maybe because they have a an epson and and <laughs> flatbed scanner or whatever um right but i do not i do none of this matters to me right i i have ways of making a negative flat i can pl apply all the light that i want um and i find this film to scan perfectly fine but depending on sort of how you scan you know i don't know you might you might run into a little issue i no no you're not it scans perfectly fine what is the speed rating 
I already talked about. So it, it's advertised as 200 or 250, 250 in daylight, 200 if, if it's a warmer light. Um, you know, is that the real speed, right? If you'll encounter people that say they shoot this at 64, they shoot it at 165, they shoot it at 200 or 400 or 640 or 800 or 1000, 1250, 1600, 2000, you'll see people say that they shoot it at 3200. Um, and I believe all that is the short story. And I'll talk more about the latitude here in a minute. You know, my favorite is sort of that 400 to 1250. Um, yeah, and I'm going to have, I'll go more into this as we go down. The latitude, right? Latitude is basically like, right, what can you get away with in terms of um, speed or pushing and pulling and you know, how much um, exposure range can it handle, etc. cetera. Um, in terms of like, I think if, if you just wanted to set your camera at like 800 or 1,000 and then just do some kind of development for a two-stop push, that's easy. That's, it's easy. Um, if you're trying to go out beyond that, well, that's that you can do it. But, right, it, you got you to gotta know. There's, there's a whole other story to doing that. And then definitely have encountered good photographers who shoot at 64, right? Uh, I take it they're not shooting probably, you know, an outdoor – uh, landscape scene with 12 stops of of exposure range right um, it's probably something that's more like five to seven stops of exposure range that they're shooting at speed 64 but whatever all right let's get to the characteristic curve so um, right the the length of the curve the length of the straight line portion of the curve right is it is it a short scale a medium scale or a long scale Right, is this covering five stops of, of light, eight stops? Can it go up to 12 stops of, of light dynamic range, right? And, and keep one-to-one -one ratio. I would call it a medium scale, right? It's not as the that one-to-one -one, uh, straight line portion, right? If you're trying to basically keep the tonal relationship of the, right, of your scene, you're trying to keep that exact same tonal relationship on the film. I think you're lucky to get maybe seven or eight stops on there, uh, maybe nine. Um, and I think that's a little that's a little bit less than like a tri X, and it's definitely um, probably you know a couple stops less than like an HP five. But I wouldn't call this a short a short uh, short um, straight line portion. Um, the this it definitely has a toe, and it's an a beautiful toe. It's not the longest toe in the world, but you can tell like there's a lot of a lot of people creating beautiful images with the 12, 1250, 1800, 640, right? And where they're using that um, right right there next to the toe and maybe you know dipping into the toe and um, it's it's an it looks really good, right? It's like um, it's a very usable toe. Um, the shoulder, right? What's inherent to the film, right? It definitely sort of, I mean, it's, it's actually hard to tell, right? Let's go to the graph for a second. Manufacturers don't tell you nearly much about sort of the shoulder because it's more dependent on developer. Um, but right, so if you look at, looking at the curve, right, which again, it's kind of showing you, it's giving you like eight, nine stops of straight line. And it's hard to really tell what's going on with the shoulder, right? And it does sort of just like, um, I haven't done a ton of exploration with, with the high, high shoulder, um, but I've never really run into problems where I blow, you know, blow out to white. And if it does, it sort of gets this like glowiness with like a little bit of detail in there. That's actually really beautiful. So, and again, it's highly dependent on your, your development and your, so it's hard to talk about the shoulder, but I, I would say that if you're somebody again, who's like, trying to shoot 10 to 12 stops of, of, um, right, of exposure difference in a landscape, right, in full sun, and you're hoping to get your shadows and not blow out any of your highlight, Pro this is not the best film for that. Um, 
you know, it might have a little more inherent contrast than 400 TX, but I would call it a very flexible film. Um, yeah, you know, the short version of that is I'd call it a medium contrast film. Um, it is not subject to light piping any more than any other film, right? It's not totally impervious, but it's, it's excellent. Um, developer combinations, right? I, again, some things I hear people say is like, it has to be a really fresh developer. And I'll say like, not really, like, I haven't, I haven't experienced any special requirements for developers for this than other, other, you know, HP five or whatever. Um, I mean, yeah, don't use old stale developer, but that's just true all the time. Um, and then what, what developer I've had so much success regardless of what developer I try. I get often when I post my photos, people are like, Whoa, what developer is this? And then I'll tell them and they might, they want to go try it, but it's, it doesn't really matter. It's Diafine, it's HC 110, it's Rodenol, it's, it's, um, uh, it's, it's Xtol, it's, um, FX2, it's, um, you know, D76, it's, it's something I've homebrewed, right? I would say it's a very flexible, uh, film for whatever developer you use. Um, and sort of just sort of comes into like how much contrast you're going for and then sort of fine tuning what kind of grain you like, sort of how, kind of how much sharpness, right? And that's, but at that point it's like, you know, you sort of need to be dialed into your developer and kind of, you know, if you're, if you're, willing to experiment and put in the time it's probably not your developer that's holding you back it's just sort of about figuring it out um i'll tell you that right now my my sort of go-to is diluted extol so i do one to four um right i like to dilute it because i, I want to keep the grain and um yeah and then right there's not as many um, recommendations for how to shoot double X on every type of developer, but I find that you basically just treat it like 400 TX or maybe like HP five roughly. And it's going to, that'll be fine. Uh, if you want it to be me, if you push me to be a little more specific, right, I would say either the same as tri X, or maybe a little more. And then uh, the same as HP five or, or maybe a little less like, you know, probably a little closer to tri X and HP five. Um, right. And all that's developer dependent, but basically like if you don't know, just develop it like, like tri X and you're, you're going to be really close to this, to the sweet spot. Uh, am I really going to compare it to all these films? Um, I am, but I'm going to go fast. So 400 TX, right. You're getting a whole nother stop of speed and, um, you know, generally finer grain and um yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna go really fast uh hp5 right you're getting a whole nother stop you're also getting a lot uh, another probably two or three stops of dynamic range um and probably more i think more yeah more pushability um Now, I, I kind of make it sound like these films are better than double X. I like double X better. Um, so I'm sort of butchering this, but T Max 400, right? It's a tabular grain, um, a little more like you got a yellow filter on the film. Forma 400 is kind of a, a larger grain, more red sensitivity. Uh, Kitmere 400, right? Basically like HP5, but not quite as much silver and not quite as much density and not quite as much pushability. Um, yeah, Delta 400. That's a T grain. Oro Oro 74 was is is a is an interesting one, um, but Oro's struggling with that as a product right now. So, um, all right. When would I not shoot double double X? Um, well, I guess if I want to shoot a color film, but I didn't put that in here. Um, if I need more speed, I'm gonna may probably go to HP5 or 400 TX. Right, it's gonna give probably probably HP five, right? I'm going to get another stop or two, um, right? If I'm really looking for speed, like shadow detail at 1600 or 3200. Um, but otherwise I'm, I'm going to prefer double X. Uh, if I'm trying to shoot right again, that 
if I need a long straight line because I've got a scene with a lot of dynamic range and I'm trying to keep that one-to-one -one relationship uh, or make that easy to to edit back in um, right if I maybe pull the film the um, right I might find I might choose something with a um, a longer scale uh, and then if I'm just wanting to shoot like some a slower film right like an like 100 speed, I might choose FP4 or, or a Ferrania film if I'm wanting a lot less grain um, or just a slower film and more like high frequency sharpness. Um, I travel with it. Don't put it through the airport scanners. Have them hand check it. Right, that's all that says here. Um, Kodak makes an awesome tech sheet, right, especially Eastman. Um, they make the best. Right. If you should read, if you're going to shoot this film, read the whole tech sheet. Um, I wish every manufacturer put a tech sheet out like Kodak Eastman does. Um, and again, that's because of the really high standards in the film industry. Uh, will this work a miracle for my crappy photos? No. Um, but you might get some black and white shots that really excite you. And that's what happened to me, right? I was kind of trying all the films and, and, tried double X and had a couple images or it was just like my jaw dropped. I was like, what is this? What is going on? There is, there is something special here. Um, the director of the lighthouse, which is sort of like pointed to as one of the best examples of how to shoot double X in modern, uh, cinema. Right. It's funny that he was actually, he actually, now his situation was a little special because they had a blue filter on and, and, um, shooting in a lot of you know well basically he was like i want this film to be faster <laughs> right um and he was wishing that kodak made triax as a cinema film right and um you know but here i'm a photographer and i'm wishing that kodak made double x as a photography film um so that brings me to kodak if you're listening um Kodak. So, well, why is it not a 400 speed film? Because that's sort of my first thing to say is like, oh, I wish this was a 400 speed film. But there's a reason it's not faster. One is they're not dumping a bunch of red sensitive dyes into it. And also they've added a sharpness dye, which gives it that interesting sharpness character that makes it really, really sharp at lower frequencies. And, uh, right, and that makes sense for cinema where you're not you're not getting caught up in wanting really fine detail, right? Um, that's the kind of sharpness that works really well with moving images. Um, and so that the, the sharpness die, between not dumping a bunch of red sensitive dyes and sharpness die, it's not a 400 speed film. Now, I'd be interested in if Kid Kodak moved the needle one stop. Um, I think there's this naive notion of what photographers want out of a film. I think there's like, oh, well, you want speed. Well, I wish that's kind of true for me. That they don't want grain, that they want long scale, that they want to be able to push it and pull it, and that they're looking for very fine detail, max resolution, and sort of this like Ansel Adams landscape type notion of, of um, right, being able to capture a scene with a lot of dynamic range and, and sort of some kind of, you know, less pictorial and more sort of, you know, scientifically perfect or something. I don't know. It, but that that's not what I'm looking for, right? A lot of times people are shooting film these days to look, you know, because there's a style and a look and something very unique about it, right? I don't mind kind of hitting the toe and hitting the shoulder and, and, Right. And, and kind of using a, a contrast that totally destroys sort of the natural tonal relationships that were in the scene. Right. There's. Um, can you make it basically the same, but one stop faster? <laughs> yeah. So I sh one of my favorite lenses. Right. I shoot at f4 30th of a second and um, I shoot inside a lot. And so but to really do that, I need quite a bit of window light. To shoot double x um, it looks amazing but yeah would love it if it could be one stop faster um 
can we keep making this film but just make it the standard photography perforation? Um, I think that would make it more accessible to a lot of people. And um, yeah, that'd be a nice touch. But then it's like they cross over to like, well, now it's a still still product and then it technically should go through Kodak Alera and you know let's not let's just avoid that right <laughs> so uh, but maybe they could sell it unperforated and, uh, and other companies could do the perforations um, Kodak has hired like 100 or 200 engineers people chemists etc uh, I would guess they're all trying to make more Portra but it'd be awesome if those new engineers could uh, you know basically bring uh, some additional black and white products to the market basically like in, in in more like double x right and less like um t-max 100 sorry if you're a t-max lover and uh, you know it has its place too um i would be happy to be a test shooter kodak if if you need that so Hopefully you learned at least one thing about double X and um, I also know that I, there, I still have a lot to learn, right? I still have a lot to learn and um, right. I'm, I'm about 600 feet in to shooting double X and um, yeah, as I learn more, I'll make more videos. I, I sort of wanted to like, be able to have example photos to go with all this but i knew that to cover all of it um i was i was gonna i didn't want to get slowed down and then it was just gonna take me a long time to pull the photos together but i will in the future make a video like that okay take care